Um, so a few things uh, I want to cover today uh, this is our last session. And I just want to sort of uh, move beyond the factors that sort of what we've been talking about, facilitating the open expression of new ideas. Um, and we talked about that with respect to brainstorming, how to get people to sort of be willing to share creative ideas. Um, we talked about how dissent is an important tool for creativity in teams. And then yesterday we talked about the importance of, of, of sharing and utilizing unique information, even though people may be reluctant to share it and teams may be reluctant to use it. It's a really critical uh, component of decision making. Um, so at this point, there are a few ideas for, on the table for how to get ideas out and expressed. Um, and I'm assuming that at some point on your teams, you're going to have more ideas than you can possibly pursue. Um, and so one of the things, one of the big themes, themes we're going to talk about today is the question of, given a number of options, how do you select which idea to pursue and what's the process that goes into that? And what I'm going to argue today is that actually uh, the process should be quite logical, but in fact it's, it's a deeply flawed process. And the, we end up paying attention to cues that are actually completely irrelevant to the content and quality of the idea itself. So we're going to talk about what those cues might be um, and, and maybe end by talking about how we can overcome these biases and make more logical decisions about which ideas uh, to pursue to fruition. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about hierarchy because hierarchy is one of those things that impacts um, not only idea expression, but um, also whose ideas we pick. Uh, to pursue. And to get us started on that, uh, before I start talking in general about how we define hierarchy, I, I just want to start by um, having you discuss these questions in your uh, small groups, uh, just to put the idea of hierarchy in your context. So I'm, I'm curious what, uh, in particular, um, in your world, what constitutes power and status? What does it mean and how do you get it? And how do you know who has it? Um, just in general terms, um, who has the power and who has status, and why would you say that about somebody? How would you describe that? So just, um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. I just want a little bit of discussion around this for five minutes before I dive into uh, what uh, people in my field have to say about how hierarchy impacts creativity. So if you could uh, address these questions in your groups, and I'll come around and try and talk to you about this. Um, yeah, it's like stunned silence right here. <laughs> <laughs> Or even faculty. Either the dean is always very unusually approachable, yeah. or it's, there's going to be a gap. Right. Yeah. 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 So age is tricky, right? It's not, there's not a straightforward relationship with status and power, right? So it's kind of, could be curvilinear. So it could be that you hit a peak and then go down, right? Or it could be that you start off high and then have nowhere to go but down. So like in math, if you haven't made a big contribution by the age of 30, you're washed up, right? Whereas in other fields, you can still be creative in your 60s, 70s, right? so it's, it varies by the field. Right, yeah. As opposed to mathematicians, you could be successful at 18 or something. All right. So um, actually, I want to pause now. I just wanted to get, we got some interesting responses as I went around the table. What is power? I heard things like resources. I heard things like, uh, you know, prestige, uh, knowledge, experience, age. Um, a lot of different things go into how people calculate uh, power and status. And this is just sort of our intuitive sense of how this works. But I want to give you the, you know, kind of academic psychological definition that there's actually a key distinction between power and status. Power means that you control a resource that you can withhold from other people if you want to get something done. And so some people, when I you know, ask, like, somebody signs the, you know, what was it? The, yeah, the purchase, like, who's, whoever signs the purchase order, that has power, right? <laughs> and they can say, like, you did something I don't like. I'm not going to sign for you anymore. That's withholding a resource. That's the use of, that's utilizing power. Um, status is a much more... Um, difficult to define and really status reflects the extent to which you have the respect uh, of others you have prestige in your groups people want to like you people want to be like you they want to affiliate with you that's status so if you think about um, you know high school popularity contests that's more about status they don't necessarily have resources they can use against you uh, but they do uh, have um, the ability to make other people like them so that's status and, and I want to talk about the implications of uh, status and, and power for creativity because I think um, that sometimes it can help the, and facilitate the expression of creative ideas, but more often than not, it's actually uh, kind of a problem. 
Um, and so one example I'm thinking of with respect to status is this uh, recurrent stereotype, at least in management, about the middle manager being this unimaginative, narrow-minded, bureaucratic person who defends the status quo at all costs, but doesn't really want to think outside the box in terms of new solutions. And there's a lot written about uh, people in the middle being that way. It's the sort of middle status bureaucrat that is very conforming, very unimaginative, and tends to block new ideas. Um, and so why might that be? And you may have experienced this in your teams or not, um, but there's kind of an interesting dynamic with respect to status um, that makes people in the middle particularly vulnerable uh, to withholding creative solutions. Um, and if you think about what status means, status means that you enjoy the respect of others, that uh, other people want to affiliate with you. When they work with you, they, they give you credit for successful outcomes, even if you don't necessarily deserve it. And so I think about high status people really roaming in this different psychological space where they're loved, they're accepted, and people, when you say ideas, people kind of say like, yeah, it's a great idea because they, you want them to like you. Um, that's the experience of being very high status. Um, now, because people with high status enjoy that kind of positive feedback from their environment, they can be very confident in suggesting unusual solutions because they think, well, why wouldn't people like my weird ideas? They generally like my ideas. And so that gives them this sort of confidence that emboldens them to share really unusual risky ideas. So often high status people are a source of creative ideas you know, in groups simply because they're very confident and willing to take risks. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have low status people who really have nothing left to lose in terms of respect and prestige that hasn't already been taken from them. And so they know that, um, well, I could say this weird solution, but um, I'm not moving up and I can't move farther down, so who cares what anyone thinks? And so often we have these low status people who are uh, very liberated um, in sharing ideas that may be uh, criticized by others, but they just don't care because where are they gonna go, right? They're already at the bottom. And so ironically, they're also a source of creative solutions. Um, in terms of hierarchy, where the problem can happen is um, in the middle of the hierarchy because people with middle status have two different concerns. One is they want to move up. And the way to move up, or so the logic goes, is I follow the rules and I behave myself and I avoid criticism and I get people to like me and so they'll permit me to move up in the hierarchy. And so that makes me really conservative and careful about suggesting ideas that might be uh, something that would be criticized by people higher up. The other concern is that if they suggest some stupid idea that nobody likes, they may move down. And so there's this risk of status loss that is really motivating uh, to the people in the middle and, and makes them want to avoid uh, the expression of solutions that are, again, unusual, risky, controversial, or likely to generate criticism. And as we've seen with creativity, that's really what you need to be creative. People who are willing to uh, stand up, say what they think, express unique information, take risks, um, and so forth. And so in terms of hierarchy, one of the things we have to be oriented to is thinking about where people are in the hierarchy you're working with and what their concerns are, especially if you're at the top and you're in a position to control the conversation, you have to realize that the people below you may be extremely concerned about what you think, so much so that they're, uh, they're going to withhold solutions uh, that may be really good, but may be risky or controversial. Um, and so, and the other interesting implication is that people at the bottom may not get much respect, but they may have good ideas simply because um, they're willing to say things no one else is willing to say. And so just thinking in general about uh, when you work in a team, what's the hierarchy, who is where, and what are the consequences of it? It's really important to think about um, in terms of creativity. Um, I do have some data where we did an experiment, and this one I'm gonna describe how I tricked other people. Uh, not, I'm not gonna trick you directly in this, uh, in this uh, session, but we manipulated people's feelings of status in an experiment in which we randomly assigned people to conditions in which they were made to feel like they had high, middle, or low status. Um, and we wanted to see what the consequences of that manipulation was for their subsequent ability to, to think of creative solutions. And so we did this a number of ways. One of them was um, asking them to imagine that they were going to be in a role-playing uh, simulation in the next round and that they were assigned to be 
in this simulation, either the president, the middle manager, or the assistant, and they had to wear name tags, and they had all these uh, things, that rules that went along with the role. And so that put them in the mindset uh, of being at one of these hierarchy levels uh, before the role-playing game uh, took place. Um, and then we also manipulated the extent to which they felt as though their ideas were going to be evaluated in the next session. So we said, look, your ideas are going to be known to everybody. They're going to be judged. Uh, and whether your ideas are good or not will determine uh, your position on the next round of this simulation. And in the other condition, we said, look, your ideas are going to be completely anonymous. No one's ever going to see them. No one's ever going to know. And then we looked to see the impact of status. Um, and what we saw was this nice curvilinear effect. If we look at, these are the number of ideas they generated on a brainstorming task after they were manipulated into feeling as though they had high, middle, or low status. And so if you look at the red bar, that's when they expected their ideas to be completely anonymous. And in those conditions, status really didn't have an impact at all, although it looks like a sort of uptick in the middle. It's really not much of a significant difference. But where you really see an impact of status is when people are told they're going to be evaluated and they feel like their status is in the middle, then we saw a significant drop, not only in the number of ideas they were willing to express, but also in how creative those ideas were, how novel they were, how high quality they were. And what we see is this sort of middle status anxiety or panic, uh, where the people in the middle, when they knew they were going to be evaluated and they were in this sort of vulnerable position, started to withhold ideas to avoid criticism. Um, and it was really driven by this threat of status loss. Um, and so if you're thinking about where you are in, in a hierarchy, um, the middle is really hit hard in terms of feeling anxious about being evaluated, much more so than people at the high or the low, uh, where their status levels may be much clearer. Yep. Anxiety and panic are medical terms as well. Did anybody <laughs> ever try to, I mean, somebody must have tried to measure that in a quantitative biochemical type way? We did, but not in a hormonal way. So there are, I could get people to sort of spit in a cup and I can actually get their actual measures of, of hormone, uh, stress hormones. We didn't do that in this study, although some people in my field do. Uh, but we actually had a tricky way of assessing their threat of status loss. And we almost gave them kind of a projective test where they had to fill in the blank. And there were, um, there were words beginning with the letter A. And we uh, coded whether or not they filled in those words with words related to anxiety. And so, so, and we did this in a number of different ways. But they're sort of projecting anxiety onto kind of a blank where they would not have normally seen it. When they were under threat, they were sort of perceiving anxiety. So, uh, without going into too much detail, but yeah, so we did measure anxiety, measure, yeah. yeah, psychologically, and there was evidence that it did mediate all of this. Um, so it, it definitely was this feeling of threat when you're in the middle, and I think that often we think about people in the bottom feeling threatened, uh, but not so much the people in the middle. But they're really feeling the brunt of it, and there's something kind of liberating about being at the bottom. If I know that nobody, I can't move up, and nobody likes me. So screw, screw the group, you know, like, I'll just say whatever, right? That's the kind of mentality at the bottom. And actually that, that kind of rebellious, I don't give a damn what anyone thinks, is kind of good for creativity. That's sort of a theme here as well, right? And it's the middle where they're kind of behaving themselves, worried about following the rules, worried about being criticized. That's where you get the most constraint, right? And that's where you have to really be concerned when it comes to, to creativity. Um, so that's the story with status. Um, and I had mentioned earlier that um, we can distinguish status and power because they're really different in terms of how they operate psychologically. And there's a lot of research showing that um, feeling powerful actually changes the way you think in a lot of important ways. Um, and one of the mo my most favorite uh, demonstrations uh, in, the, in the literature is this experiment where they manipulated people into feeling as though they had power high or low. And then they asked them to draw the letter E on their forehead without telling them anything else. Just here's a erasable marker and draw the letter E on your forehead. And what they found was that the powerful people drew the E so that it was visible from their own perspective. So this, right? The powerless people drew the E so that it was comprehensible from the people looking at them, right? And I think that gets at, in a really clever way, the fundamental difference between people who have high power and people who have low power. The powerful uh, view the world as their oyster, that um, they can take risks and they can, um, that they're full of opportunities, right? 
uh, the people who have high power tend to stereotype other people more, rel uh, more readily. So they're more likely to resort to stereotypes when they're uh, interacting with people. They find it more difficult to take the perspective of other people. So really imagine the world through the eyes of another person. When you're feeling powerful, that's much more difficult. They tend to be overly confident. They tend to take more risks than people who are lower in power. Um, they tend to see uh, big picture uh, issues, but they have a difficult time focusing on specific details, whereas the low power people are so feeling threatened, right, that they want to make sure that every detail is accounted for, um, that they want to make sure they understand other people's perspectives so that they don't offend people, um, that they're more likely to think in less stereotypical ways. And so there are some so, sort of a mixed bag in terms of power. There are some benefits to feeling powerful, the sort of the confidence, the big picture uh, thinking, uh, but there are some deficits as well, which is that uh, you tend to overlook details, um, and I'm not talking about you, Daryl, so I think maybe you're the high power uh, <laughs> prototype in the room, where right? yeah, it's like shrink down. Uh, posture is actually another thing. They did another, uh, they did a study on posture, and um, uh, when people are made to feel powerful, they take up more space physically. Um, I have a study showing that, yeah, right. It's, they call it man spreading, but women do it too, right? Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. Um, I also have another study showing that powerful people literally overestimate how tall they are. So they think they're taller than they, actually, than they actually are. And we showed this in the lab where they actually measured their height and they systematically overestimated it. So powerful people are, are sort of walking around feeling large, right? And so this is really a completely different psychological experience um, and one that has implications for creativity, decision making, all kinds of things. Um, but in terms of creativity, um, the, the relationship to power is actually really quite straightforward. The more powerful you are, the more confident you are to suggest unusual novel solutions. And so power ends up being an advantage in terms of creativity. And so we did an experiment again on brainstorming where we manipulated people into feeling high, low, middle power. And then we counted the number of ideas they were willing to express. And we found this straightforward linear relationship. People with high power who felt powerful generated the most ideas and then it went down from there in a really straightforward linear pattern. And the power less were the least creative. And so that's where, again, we start to see differences between power and status. Um, and so if you put these things together, uh, one of the implications for me is that um, if you look at the intersection of power and status, and most of the time, if you think about it, people who have power also have status. They tend to go together. Uh, they give people at the top an incredible advantage in terms of creativity because they're more confident and more bold about suggesting ideas that might be novel. Um, and then when you move down the hierarchy, it's sort of, it becomes mixed and more complicated. Um, if you look purely at status, the middle are suffering the most in terms of creativity because they're most concerned with behaving themselves and following rules. Uh, with respect to power, people who are low power are the ones that are, are the most affected in terms of creativity. And so I think, uh, particularly I think the responsibility is on the people with power uh, to think about how to foster an environment in which people feel comfortable expressing creative solutions. And so you really have to caution the person with power is going to feel the most confident about speaking first, speaking often, interrupting, and we have data to show this, that the powerful are more likely to cut people off, are more likely to speak first, they're more likely to make the first offer in a negotiation, uh, they're more likely to initiate negotiations, they're just more confident in general. But um, they really have to be careful to let other people speak first because once the powerful person has spoken, creativity then is pretty much uh, going to be gone because everybody will tend to conform to whatever the powerful person uh, thinks. And um, I think another important implication is that if you want creative ideas, anonymity really helps. Um, and so you want to make sure that people have um, a way to express ideas it, um, where they're not necessarily going to be held accountable and feel as though they're going to be criticized. And we, again, this is another theme we talked about with brainstorming where criticism is really an issue um, in terms of depressing people's willingness to think of, of creative solutions. Um, and one final implication that I'm going to uh, expand on uh, for the rest of this uh, talk is the implications for power and creativity. Is it that feeling powerful makes you more creative? Or is it when you have power, people are more willing to label your perhaps not very good ideas as being more creative than they really are. And so those are two separate issues. 
there is some evidence I just presented that feeling powerful actually triggers creativity in an objective sense. But I think there's more to the story than that. And so um, at this point, I want to turn to uh, another key question when it comes to uh, creativity, which is how do we make judgments about what's creative? Um, and this is a subjective process of evaluation that isn't always logical, isn't always ordered, isn't always uh, going to be the best process. And the big idea here is that people have an idea of what it means to be a creative type. And, uh, and I'll expand more on what that, what that entails. But if you seem like a creative type, your ideas are going to be favored in this evaluation process. People are going to actually ascribe more creativity to you, uh, whether or not you deserve it, uh, and for reasons that have to do more with the way your idea is presented and who you are than what your ideas are actually about. And so um, at this point, I want to stop and give you the infamous uh, measure that would work better if you didn't know what this was about. But anyway, we'll, if you answer honestly, you'll get more information about yourself. Um, but the instructions are at the top, and uh, I'll tell you what to do with it, how to score it in a second. So I'll get to the, the measure in a second, but um, what you just filled out is um, the most widely used measure of narcissistic personality. And last time I said this was, I made the distinction, this is subclinical narcissism. So what this means is that if you score really high, it doesn't mean you're mentally ill. Uh, there is something called narcissistic personality disorder, like you believe you're Joan of Arc or something, or that, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, that's not what this is. So, um, so it ranges up to a score of 16. And what this describes, I think everybody kind of knows intuitively what a narcissist is, but um, it's really a personality that is self-aggrandizing, self-absorbed, uh, very individualistic, egocentric, um, and really expects uh, to get more outcomes than they really deserve based on an objective assessment of their work. And so there's a lot of research looking at the behavior of narcissists. Um, narcissistic students are more likely to, for example, uh, complain about their grades. Uh, than others. And so every time somebody comes to complain about a grade in my class, I was, I'm thinking, I know what your score is on this uh, scale, right? Uh, and it's always like, all right, my work is great. How could you dare you know, not give me this, the grade I deserved? Um, if you look at their speech patterns, they actually use the singular first person pronoun I and me more, than, more often than everybody else. Um, they're also more likely to stare into a mirror when given the opportunity. And so there was an experiment set up where there was a mirror in a hallway and people were in a hurry on their way from one point to another. And their score on this narcissism scale actually predicted whether or not they would pause and look in the mirror. So it literally is being in love with your own reflection. Uh, this is very true, this uh, myth. Um, and so there are a lot of behavioral implications for narcissism. Um, in terms of your scores, um, the, the median score in narcissism in the research I'm going to talk about, which is done um, at Berkeley, Stanford, and here at Cornell, um, was seven in this sample. So uh, for the purposes of my talk, if you were above seven, you would be considered one of, lumped with the narcissist. If you were below seven, not so much, right? You're not, you're less narcissistic, but it is a continuous measure. Um, I always admit I scored 11 when I took it, uh, so I'm not exactly shy. Uh, but um, so I'm just curious. I'm just curious, how many people scored above seven on this? Oh, wow. Oh. Interesting. <laughs> so, so this is a really interesting, and I'm just learning about your, your culture, engineering culture. Uh, you're, you, I'm shocked at Baltimore it was the same pattern, that much lower levels of narcissism than I see in the other groups that I talk to about this. So I actually find that charming. You're, you're actually realistic. Right? Um, unlike me, who's you know, a raging narcissist. Um, but <laughs> and, uh, whatever. Um, so in terms of creativity, um, what are the implications of this? And, and uh, my co-authors and I were really interested in uh, first starting out, could there be an advantage um, in terms of narcissism for objective creative potential? Um, and so there, there's lots of anecdotal evidence of highly creative people making incredibly narcissistic statements. And I just put up one by Picasso who compared himself to God. And this is really typical of a narcissistic response. Um, so, you know, I mentioned last time Trump is like a treasure trove of narcissistic quotes. It's like, 
uh, we're going to make America great because I am great and uh, God, I'm going to fix everything and you know no one's less racist than I am and no one's better with the Japanese than I am. I mean, it's just uh, on and on, right? He's sort of a textbook a narcissist if I were to sort of diagnose him based on his public statements. Um, so does that make him more creative? And we're sort of interested in trying to figure out uh, that question as a first step. Um, and so we took two really widely used measures of creative ingenuity. Um, they're both weird, so I'll, I'll describe both of them. Uh, the first one is um, called structured imagination. And what you ask people to do is draw, to imagine themselves on a planet that is completely unlike Earth in every possible dimension you can imagine and draw a creature that is native to that planet. Um, and what you normally get is uh, little green men, right, that are uh, really just minor variations on a human being, right? So what people do is they imagine what they know best, they tweak it a little bit, but not too much, and their imagination is structured and constrained by what they know. And more creative thinkers generate aliens that uh, may not have bilateral symmetry, uh, may not have the traditional uh, number of sense organs, may have additional uh, senses that people don't have, uh, may have uh, them arranged in a different configuration. So we actually code and see how unusual their responses are. Um, the next one is a, a divergent thinking task, which asks people to generate as many alternative uses for a brick as possible. Most of the time people talk about use a brick to build something, use a brick to build a bridge, use a brick to build a house, so on. Um, these are really unimaginative responses. More unusual ones would be like use a brick to throw through a window to make a political statement, um, use a brick as um, to cast a shadow, use a brick as a topic for conversation. I've seen lots of really abstract and clever uh, responses to this. And so we again coded for the novelty of the responses. And again, the question is, were the narcissists more clever uh, on this task than other people? And uh, so that was the first question. The second is, do they think they're more clever than other people? And so we asked them a series of questions um, to evaluate their own ideas. So for example, the space creature I drew was highly creative. I probably drew a space creature that was unlike anything anyone ever saw, and so on. You know, my, my drawing was really unusual. And so um, if they agree to this, that reflects more confidence. Um, so what do the results show? If you compare the responses, the self-evaluations on both tasks, the narcissists thought their ideas were more creative on average than the non-narcissists. And that's consistent with what we know about their personalities being self-aggrandizing, self-absorbed, overly confident, right? So this was true of their evaluations of creativity as well. They were more confident that their solutions were more creative than anyone else's. But the key thing is that if you look at whether or not narcissism was correlated with their objective performance on this task, we saw zero correlation. It wasn't negative, but it wasn't positive either. So narcissism had no impact at all on the objective ingenuity, cleverness, novelty of any of their responses. And it held whether we controlled for gender, whether we controlled for major, whether we controlled for age. We really try hard to make this come out one way or the other, and it's just not there. So, and, and since then, we've looked at other measures of creative uh, potential, and we found no link between narcissism and objective creative performance. And so that uh, was sort of our first step in sort of thinking about the relationship between creativity and narcissism. If there is one, it's not in terms of an objective performance uh, uh, output. Now, we thought, well, thinking about the creative process, maybe it's not objective performance, but maybe their advantage is in getting people to endorse their ideas as being creative. And there's a lot of evidence in social psychology, even going back to the 1960s, to suggest that confidence uh, is more persuasive to people than uh, modesty. And so one classic example of this is a study in which uh, people were uh, given the opportunity uh, to sit at a conference table, very much like a rectangular like this one, and they looked to see uh, whether people took the head seat or not. And what they found was that taking the head seat at the beginning of a meeting made your ideas more plausible, more convincing, um, and more persuasive than people who took the side seats. And it's simply because taking the head seat signals leadership and confidence. And the more confident you are that you're important and that your ideas are good, the more likely people respond and agree, and agree with your judgment, particularly when there aren't any objective standards for evaluating performance, as there often is not in creative pursuits. And so um, it's that kind of ambiguity 
that really drives this attribution of creativity. And um, so we thought maybe the same thing is going on with narcissists. And so our prediction was that the more narcissistic you are when you pitch an idea, the more likely evaluators will judge your ideas to be creative. And so we set up a little experiment to test this uh, by creating, recreating in the lab um, uh, a Hollywood pitch uh, session in which people were brought into the lab and randomly assigned to be either a idea pitcher or an idea evaluator. The idea pitchers were uh, asked to complete the survey that you just uh, finished to measure their narcissism. And then they were told that their assignment was to come up with a new movie idea, preferably one that is creative in the context of movies that have been shown before. And so they had 10 minutes to think of an idea and prepare a pitch. And then the evaluators were just told to listen to the pitch silently and then make an evaluation of the, the quality and creativity and so forth of the movie idea. And um, so after the pitch was completed, they came in, they delivered their pitch, and they shared their idea. Um, and what we found was that a direct correlation, the more narcissistic the pitcher was, the more likely the evaluator was to judge their ideas as being creative. And more importantly, when we back, went back and actually coded for creativity, we found that none of the movie ideas were actually very good. And in fact, narcissism didn't correlate with an objective measure of the ideas that were actually stated. And so there was something in the self-presentation. Um, and so we saw things like the narcissist coming in and saying, I'm about to tell you the best idea you've heard all day. And this is a great idea. And people responded to that uh, pitch in a way that made them seem more uh, creative to others. And this was kind of explained by the evaluator's perception that the pitcher was charismatic, witty, um, extreme, and enthusiastic. And so what, what the evaluators were picking up on wasn't off-putting narcissism. It was actually uh, charisma, confidence. They were charming. Um, and so in these evaluations, uh, narcissism is an advantage because it conveys confidence. And so one of the pieces of advice I, I give the people I teach my course to is that uh, we found no evidence that too much confidence is off-putting in any of these pitch situations. Um, we've tested the limits of this, and so far we have not found. We thought there must be an extreme where you get so obnoxious that no one can stand you, right? But we have not found the upper limit, right? <laughs> I have yet to see it. It's like the more obnoxiously overconfident people are, the more likely the evaluator is like, yeah, that's a good idea. It's just mind-boggling to me. Uh, particularly in the context of what's going on now politically. Uh, but there is no upper limit to this, and so I'm always uh, sort of shocked by this. Yeah, question. Is it ethical though and reasonable? Is it what? Ethical though or reasonable? Yeah, so what I. What I, so I don't know for sure, but what our data would suggest is that it's not as applicable when you're only seeing something in writing. Because that's what our coders were reading when they made their judgments without the pitch. They were just looking at the pitch in writing. Um, but what I don't know is whether narcissists convey their ideas in writing in a way that projects more confidence than non-narcissists. And that would be interesting too. So I would love to do a study where we uh, actually looked at written pitches and see if there are any markers of confidence that are more likely to emerge when you're narcissistic. I, I imagine there are, I just don't have any data yet uh, to speak to it. But I think one of the questions that comes up is, um, how do we structure the evaluation process to get rid of this bias? Like, is there a way we can, um, we can value the ideas of people who aren't quite as confident? Um, and I think what I mean, one practical way may be to think in advance about what your criteria are for evaluating ideas and, so, and stick to those criteria so you're not as likely to be taken in by this sort of narcissistic self-presentation. Uh, but we're just at the beginning trying to figure out how to get around this because people are incredibly receptive to confidence. Um, just to give you another example, uh, there was one study recently in which people were manipulated into feeling powerful, powerless, because I think power, the high power people resemble narcissists in a lot of ways. Um, and people who did the power manipulation were more likely in a subsequent interview to get a call back and to get an offer than people who feel less powerful. So this sort of powerful self-aggrandizing 
confident kind of self-presentation is disturbingly effective when it comes to uh, the idea evaluation process. And I'm not endorsing that as ideal by any means, but it seems to be sort of what we're uncovering as a sort of fact of, of, of life. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to do that too. So how <laughs> stupid can your ideas be? I think we're witnessing that right now. <laughs> and, you know, and there doesn't seem to be a lower limit on stupidity, uh, I, at least none that I can see. Uh, but I, I mean, we haven't seen, uh, we haven't done an experiment to test that. So I would love to vary uh, the objective stupidity of the idea to see how low you can go before somebody says like, but wait a minute, this really actually doesn't make any sense. Uh, but that's one of the things we'd love to do with this, yeah. Yeah. Are they actually though? Can't you do No, it? absolutely not. That's a great question. Yeah. So what I what I meant is that the more narcissistic you are, the more confident your self presentation is. But you can be confident and competent at the same time. It's just that narcissists tend not to have that combination, right? <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. Like theoretically high narcissism on this test, but not have like high confidence because I don't know. Yeah, they're just so or theoretically, yeah, I mean, they're, if they are distinct, you should observe that, but they're highly correlated. Okay, so you have like the, that minion in your foot. Oh, yeah, and not just me, other people. So just talking about, um, I, I think the really good evidence of that is the, the study, the linguistic study that looked at how often they talk about themselves. I mean, they're just so self-focused. And the other data I presented, um, evaluating their own ideas, they're just more likely to say, my ideas are great than other people. And part of it, and so here's where it gets tricky, is that there's some evidence that narcissists are actually deeply insecure, um, that at some level they suspect they might not be as good as they are. And so the danger then is that when you question and criticize a narcissist, they respond with something called narcissistic aggression. Um, and to avoid that, one of the strategies is that you have to feed the narcissist. So if you want to get on their good side, you really have to praise them constantly. But if you don't, they really lash out violently. And I have to say, this is work that was done in the 80s long before Trump ever darkened the face of the earth or this election. <laughs> and so this, I mean, it's really disturbingly accurate, right? That you, you are, um, you, you're, you can't really question them and expect them to be reflective and patient and willing to rethink their point of view. So, uh, so if you have a boss that's a narcissist, it's really something to think about. Um, the dealing with them becomes difficult. Uh, just ask my students, it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> right, angry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, oh, that, that's a really interesting testable prediction. Yeah, I have no idea, but that's a really great. Um, thought. And so, so that would assume that people are wise enough to pick up on the fact that narcissists respond aggressively. And so you tiptoe around them and that involves endorsing their ideas even when they're not very good. That, that would be, I would love to do that study, but I can't tell you. I mean, it makes perfect sense, but, uh, but I think that's really plausible. Yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah. Um, there's none that I know of. I've never seen, yeah, so, sorry. I don't know, what would your prediction be? I love asking that. I don't know, I'm just, I'm just curious. Well, I suspect it was motivated by a prediction. <laughs> 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 These questions always are. I always say, what do you think? Uh, so, I, I mean, there is some research, you know, suggesting that men are more prone to overconfidence and risk-taking, and part of it is mediated by actually uh, testosterone just does that to us unfortunately. So the more testosterone men have floating in their brains, the stupider they, they're likely to be, in term, in, in, particularly in uh, situations that involve risk and physical danger. Uh, there was one really cool study uh, that was done by somebody who studied uh, skateboarders who were doing stunts. And he did this manipulation where he had an attractive female either watch them or, or not be present while they were doing their stunts. And they found that in the presence of an attractive female, the skateboarders literally did more risky stunts and were more likely to get injured. Um, and it was completely mediated by 
uh, levels of testosterone in their blood. So uh, this is really unflattering to the men in the room, sorry. Um, but I think there is something to that. But in terms of narcissism, um, I haven't seen anything that suggests that women are lower or higher or anything like that, but that's an interesting question. Um, so narcissism is one, I think, element of this process that matters in terms of uh, creativity. Um, I just want to mention quickly that narcissism, how it can be an advantage. Uh, we actually looked at this in teams, and we thought, well, on teams, could there be some advantage to having a narcissist or two in the group? Because we talked about uh, the value of dissent and being confident and being willing to share unique information and insisting that people pay attention to what you know. That sounds a bit like it could benefit from some narcissism, right? And so we actually looked at this in teams, and when I Googled two narcissists, I actually got them uh, so, well, anyway, maybe we're surprised, maybe not. Uh, I'm hoping everybody knows who these people are, but anyway, if you don't, you're more ele far more elevated than I am. Um, so we actually looked at creativity in teams. Um, this was in my class, looking at undergraduates working over the course of a semester to do a project uh, together, and we were actually able to measure everyone's narcissism and count. Okay, is this team, in a team of four, do you have one narcissist, two, three, or four, right? And, look, and we can correlate that with creative output and what we found is that there are actually some benefits of uh, having a couple of narcissism. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, right, 1.72. Uh, so you, if you look at the creative process, or at least how they described it, um, we saw that the more narcissists you have, the more likely you are to do things that are good for the creative process, like explore alternatives, you know, go, engage in debates, being thorough, all the things we talked about as being good for creativity. But that tops out at around uh, two. And then once you go past that, you start to see uh, a diminishing return from having too many narcissists. And one of the things we found is that uh, these narcissists had so much conflict and so much rancor, and they couldn't agree on anything, that they ended up being late often with their work, and they met later in the semester, and they tended to be behind. Um, and the people with no narcissists were just really boring. I mean, they just, everyone, it was just kind of bland, right? Nobody took risks and because you need somebody who's kind of out there saying crazy things to sort of inspire people to follow suit. So that's uh, one way of looking at narcissism. We also coded their solutions uh, to see the extent to which they diverged from what is already being done. And we found, again, this exact same pattern on a different measure. Uh, narcissism was an advantage to a point, and then it started to drop off. So if you look at narcissism in teams, having a couple of them around is good. Uh, what we don't know is, um, since these were all groups of four, is it something magical about half, or is it that you just need the interaction between two to create that. So that's one of the things we're following up on. But um, I'm probably the only one who's said that there's some advantage to narcissism. Uh, usually they're painted in sort of destructive terms. Uh, but I think there could be some advantage uh, to, to having them around in terms of generating controversy, saying things that maybe other people might not be willing to say, modeling confidence for the rest of the group and being sort of out there uh, could be good in terms of creativity. Uh, so how superficial can we get, right? So moving beyond narcissists, and I only have a few minutes, but I want to talk about like how superficial people can actually get in terms of uh, making these judgments. And so narcissism is one thing, uh, but we're actually looking at uh, really superficial aspects of appearance um, like hair. And so we did a kind of a quick experiment looking at uh, the extent to which uh, people are persuaded uh, to endorse an idea based simply on the, the person's superficial appearance. And so we did a study in which we had pit, people pitch either creative or practical ideas, um, and we pre-tested those ideas to, so that we knew which ones tended to be viewed as creative or practical. And so we asked people uh, to generate ideas about how uh, air, airlines can generate more revenue. And one of the prototypical creative ideas was allow in-flight gambling. One of the boring ideas was charge for in-flight meals. Um, and so we actually then had people evaluate how creative those ideas were, knowing nothing about the picture except their appearance, and we varied what their hair looked like. And so we had the unconventional looking guy and the conventional looking guy, and we had pre-tested this to make sure that people did view this hairstyle on the right as being more conventional. What's depressing is that this simple hairstyle had a significant impact on the way people evaluated ideas. And the same in-flight gambling idea was viewed as more creative when it was pitched by the guy with crazy hair compared to the guy with uh, the shaved hair. Sorry, Daryl, you would be in the conventional, <laughs> you would be in the conventional condition at a serious disadvantage on this. Um, but again, this is, I think, more evidence that 
the process of generating ideas is really um, not as logical and objective as we'd like to think, and incidental aspects of people's appearance uh, has a significant impact on whether or not you think people's ideas are good. Um, and so we've replicated this with religion. So the same idea pitched by somebody who uh, is said to be Buddhist is viewed as more creative than uh, the other monotheistic religions. Uh, we looked at uh, political affiliation, someone who claims to be politically independent, uh, their idea is viewed as more creative than someone who belongs to one of the mainstream parties. We looked at region, uh, the same idea pitched by someone from the Midwest is viewed as less creative than someone who, who is from either of the coasts. Uh, unfortunately for me, who's moving to Illinois uh, next week, I'll be at a disadvantage. Um, but again, the superficial cues really drive judgments in ways that I think are disturbing, uh, mainly because I think the process should be fair, but it's not. And I didn't even go into the obvious impact of gender, of age, of race. It goes without saying that those have an impact too. And, and those are gonna be even more difficult to overcome than biases rooted in, in superficial uh, things like this. So um, again, I think disturbing information for anyone who hopes that their ideas will be evaluated fairly, um, these cues actually matter a lot. Um, the final point I wanna end with is uh, sort of a cynical point about creative leadership. Um, and I saw a lot of press, uh, particularly a few years ago, there was a, um, a survey done by IBM looking at uh, uh, actually surveying CEOs of major uh, corporations, asking them, uh, what's the most important quality in a leader that predicts leadership effectiveness? And the number one thing they came up was creativity. And my colleagues and I were really skeptical about this because uh, what we found in our own research is that people are deeply uh, mistrustful of creativity and that there's generally a bias against novelty and people really don't like to endorse creative ideas. So we're a bit skeptical about the extent to which people really want creative leadership. And our reasoning was that when you look to a leader, the team leader is someone who should establish order, uh, somebody who should make uh, the environment predictable for others, whereas creative people tend to be unpredictable right, quirky, unusual, and these things should be at odds with that leadership prototype. Um, so we actually tested, do people actually want um, creative leadership? And what we, we did was, for example, in one experiment, we put people in an interview situation and we, we randomly assigned people to either express a creative solution or a practical solution. And then we had an interviewer evaluate their leadership potential, their competence, and their likability. And what we found was that people who pitched a creative idea were not viewed as less competent than others. They weren't viewed as less likable, but they were viewed as having less leadership potential than people who express practical ideas. Um, and we've replicated this in a number of ways. And what this suggests to me is that although we complain about the lack of creativity at the top and everyone thinks they want creative leaders, uh, people often fail to select creative people to leadership positions because they view them as quirky, unpredictable, uh, unusual. We like having them around, but we don't trust them to lead the group. Um, and so I think this idea that, uh, that we want creative leadership or that it's welcomed at the top is really, I think I'm pretty skeptical about that. Oh, I think that we should have creative leadership. I think it's more often the case that creative people are sort of filtered out on their way to the top. Um, so that's the last depressing point I want to end with. Um, and just a few uh, conclusions. Again, this, the judgments of creativity are surprisingly superficial uh, and driven by things like confidence, hair, appearance, all kinds of things that shouldn't have any impact on the way people evaluate ideas, but we're learning that they are. Um, and so just having a good idea isn't enough. You have to think about how you package the idea how you present your ideas to others, and even how you present yourself uh, to the world in order to gain acceptance. And I, unfortunately, I think that's, uh, that's uh, what, what we're left with. So um, I am at the end of my time, but I just wanna get, since this is my last uh, session, I'm happy to take questions about creativity in general or anything else that came up uh, before we wrap up. You're like stunned into silence. <laughs> <laughs> all right, if everything was, yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah, if you look at my work, it's all negative. I hope it doesn't reflect anything about my, my general point of view on the world. But I think people are kind of depressing. I became an academic, so I just 
wouldn't have to talk to some people so much, you know, I sort of lock myself. Because, and then I study them and find out that they do all kinds of crazy things. But uh, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, is it depressing? I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of joking, but um, I, I think it's only depressing if we end here and don't try and figure out how to solve these problems, right? And so I always look for moderators that, okay, maybe we typically get this terrible thing happening, but how do we reverse it? Um, and I think that there are ways of, of getting around these issues. Um, but uh, since they only gave me a few hours with you, I only gave you the depressing part, then if you want to hear the solutions, you have to pay me to come back. Uh, <laughs> that's my usual pitch. Uh, but anyway, I don't, I don't want to force you to ask questions. Seems like everybody's probably tired out and it's cocktail hour. So I'll just end it here. It was great to meet you. Um, I'll be at Illinois, but if you have any questions about creativity, I'm happy to correspond with people by email or, or talk after. But uh, for now, I guess I'll turn it over to, is there a slide deck thing? There is a slide deck. Uh, there is a slide deck. All right. So take it away. <laughs> Thanks.